Hello, I'm meteorologist Jeff Matthews, and you're on the module entitled Clouds and Precipitation. So we're going to focus on clouds and precipitation for the next several minutes. You ever wonder why sometimes clouds form and sometimes they don't? Or why sometimes are clouds small and puffy, and other times they become enormous thunderstorms that produce torrential rains, lightning, and wind? Well, it all goes back to the water cycle with evaporation and condensation. If there's enough moisture in the air, or at least there's bodies of water to evaporate from, then it comes down to whether there's enough energy from the sun to heat the earth to create evaporation and then condensation. Let's get back to our model of the earth. Half of the earth is always in sunlight and the other half is always in darkness. And because the Earth rotates, that half changes all the time. So that means, since half the Earth is warmer than the other half at any given time, there are also pressure differences on the Earth. And that causes the air to rise. Eventually, if it reaches high enough, it'll cool off enough to where it condenses and forms cloud cover. And if it does this vigorously enough, it can go from those fair weather clouds to violent thunderheads. Okay. Let's talk about the process. So the air rises with water vapor in it, and it climbs to the point where it condenses and forms those cumulus clouds on the left. If it continues to rise, it might reach the freezing level, where it's cold enough to where the water droplets freeze. If those water droplets freeze, they then begin to fall back down towards Earth and sometimes they can form hail in these thunderstorms. Hail is a very interesting phenomenon. It's different from sleet. Sleet falls one time from the cloud down to the ground. Hail travels to the top of the cloud as a water droplet, freezes, falls because of gravity, and then climbs again with a new layer of water, climbs to the top, and freezes again over and over and over. If the wind in the thunderstorm is strong enough upwards, it'll continue to cause those droplets to go up and down and accumulate layers of water to freeze at the top of the cloud and come back down. When the he heaviness of the pellet overcomes the wind, in other words, gravity becomes stronger than the amount of wind in the thunderstorm, it'll fall to ground as hail. If it's only made a few trips to the top of the cloud and gained layers of ice, it might be the size of a pea. But if it climbs enough times to the top of the cloud, they can grow to the size of a softball, and that would cause devastating damage to anything that those hailstones fall onto. Okay, it's time for our clouds and precipitation quiz. Have your thinking hat on? Pen and paper ready? You can pause, don't forget, the tape to allow students to have the opportunity to come up with answers with as much time as you need. Question number one. Why do clouds form? We covered that. Question number two. At the freezing level, what may form? And then question number three. Why is some hail big and some hail small? Think about that. We'll come right back. Quiz answers. Number one. Why do clouds form? The sun heats the earth. Half the earth at any given time causes the warmth to gather evaporation and cause condensation as the warm air rises, and that creates the cloud cover. If the cloud reaches the freezing level, what may form? Hail, which leads to our third question, why is some hail big and some hail small? The bigger hail is able to go from the cloud bottom to the cloud top more times to gather a layer of water down below and then freeze it on top of itself at the top. The smaller hail doesn't have the strong enough winds to carry it to the top enough times to create the bigger hailstones. So that's why some hail is big and some hail is small. Now in this case, we don't have a demonstration we have an experiment for your viewing pleasure. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to this explainer, an experiment to demonstrate how clouds form in the first place. 
All I need for this is a container half filled with water. And by the way, a trick question, is the container half full? The answer is, yes, it is half full of water, but it's full full to the top with water plus air. So it's not just a half empty container. Also, for this experiment, I'll need a match to create heat. Okay, we have a container, half filled with water, half filled with air. What I'm going to do is I'm going to light the match. I'm going to put it over top of the container. I'm going to squeeze the container to try to suck the heat in from the match without burning myself. And then I'm going to quickly close the container so that nothing can go in or out. And then I'm going to squeeze the container and apply pressure to it because you need both air pressure to change and the temperature to increase. And of course, one does create the other in the first place. And then watch what happens inside the container. Here we go. I light the match. I've got heat. I put it over top of the container. I squeeze the container and you see the match light moving in response to the wind pressure I'm creating that's absorbing the heat from the match. Now just to be safe when I'm done, I'm going to drop the match in the water so the match goes out. I close the lid quickly. Look out! No, nothing goes wrong. It's closed. I squeeze the container and what do you see happening at the top? Can you see how it's foggy at the top? Let's bring it a little bit closer. I've created fog or a type of cloud. There you go. Not nearly as clear as it was before I put the heat over top and applied pressure to it. So that's how clouds form in the first place and eventually precipitation. I hope you enjoyed this experiment.